Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hokioji's Sunday Dharma Talk. This morning, I'm very pleased to introduce Reverend Mio O. Habermas Sher. She is a Zen Buddhist priest and teacher in the lineage of Katagiri Roshi, with whom she studied from 1975 until his death. She recently retired from her position as an interfaith staff chaplain at the U of M Medical Center Fairview. Earlier in her career, she was a dancer, choreographer, and also maintains a practice as a somatically based voice coach. Voice work. Practicing intensively in the Zen and Vipassana Buddhist traditions, Mio'o has been continuously working to deepen her insight for more than 45 years. In 2000, she was ordained in the Soto Zen Buddhist tradition with the name Ryugen Mio'o, which means dragon's voice, subtle working. In 2012, she received Dharma transmission from Reverend Dokai Georgeson, and she's also very happy to be a grandma. <laughs> Welcome, Mio'o. Hi, friends. Hi, everybody. Um, let's see, can you hear me? Okay, so that's good. All right. Um, oh, this is this is like having a party. <laughs> a party on Zoom. Right? Just all my friends. <laughs> um so, uh, let's see here. Um, the title of my talk today is Earth. But you know what? I'm going to turn on this one other light in here so I can see better. This is a... Okay. <clears throat> The Dalai Lama says the purpose of life is not to transcend the body, but to embody the transcendent. I'm also going to get rid of myself. Just a sec. There, much better. Okay. The purpose of life is not to transcend the body, but to embody the transcendent. When I was a little girl, my mom took me to uh, see the ballet and uh, the beauty of what I experienced <laughs> there gave rise to my profound wish to understand and embody that beauty. And this has been my wish, intention and practice. My soul was gifted with that deep longing and wish, but my body was not so strong and my feet were weak. <laughs> Yet I have continued since I was seven years old to investigate this embodiment. So for me, one of the great draws of Zen has been that it is an embodied practice Zazen, ceremony, bowing, chanting, cooking, cleaning, studying, talking, and helping. Um, probably like everyone at this talk, I had the privilege of some education. Uh, I remember when Annika, my daughter, uh, was ready to go off to college. And, you know, we were doing that thing, like trying which college and how is this going to all work. Um, I suddenly had a powerful experience of disillusionment. I realized if this wonderful education was so wonderful, it would have solved all these human problems that have clearly not been solved. Um, 
So all the hype about college education is kind of a big lie. The ed I called it the educational industrial complex. And I was very upset. <laughs> Yet, um, maybe you guys know the Sufi character Nasruddin. Uh, he said, uh, you have to drink the water that is making us all crazy. Or as Katagiri Roshi said to me once, to the minimum, you must, you can fill in the blank what you have to do to the minimum. Otherwise, you will be completely isolated. So after that education, which many of us have had, there's another education that we might take up only if the heart is still weeping, unsatisfied, and possibly lost. We are used to looking for surcease by doing research in the stacks of the library. As the manager in the play, Our Town, do you remember that play? Tells Emily, who asks him, is anybody really alive every, every minute? And he says, saints and poets, they are some. So we might start with poets, for instance, T.S. Eliot. At the still point of the turning world, neither flesh nor fleshless, neither from nor towards, at the still point, there the dance is, but neither arrest nor movement. And do not call it fixity, where past and future are gathered, neither movement from nor towards, neither ascent nor decline, except for the point, the still point, there would be no dance, and there is only the dance. I can only say there we have been, but I cannot say where, and I cannot say how long, for that is to place it in time. So if we are lucky with our weeping heart, we fall into a poem like this, and something within us recognizes something within the poem. And then we follow that something. Usually we don't know where we're going. So as we're following that unknown road, we might learn how to return to the ground of the body, the alchemical vessel that like a butterfly's cocoon already has its butterfly parts embedded in it. The body speaks, moves, writes, emails, hugs, holds hands, loves, gets confused, writes itself, plants seeds. The Alaya Vijnana storehouse consciousness floats in the body. It's part of the nine energy bodies that operate in accordance with the source. So maybe we swim our way to that consciousness returning to the place of rest that promises nothing in particular, yet allows us to recognize how the butterfly parts construct and deconstruct themselves. So in our tradition, we are instructed to return over and over to Zazen, to return to the earth, to learn again and again by experiencing presence with every sort of breath, feeling, thought. We're like fine musicians. There's no end to the subtlety that can arise. And that, that subtlety is so not me in the narrow sense of that word. And I say, 
thank goodness. So we're re instructed in the foundational Satipatthana Sutta, maybe you remember. So I'll just read a little bit of this. Thus also monks, a monk lives contemplating the body in the body. And further monks, a monk knows when she is going, I am going. She knows when he is standing, I am standing. She knows when he is sitting, I am sitting. He knows when he is lying down, I am lying down. Or just as his body is deposed, so she knows it. Thus she lives contemplating the body in the body internally. So I would say internally is sensing internally, or he lives contemplating the body in the body externally, or she lives contemplating the body in the body internally and externally. He lives contemplating origination factors in the body, or she lives contemplating dissolution factors in the body, or she lives contemplating origination and dissolution factors in the body. So that's a pretty good description of uh, some things that can happen in Zazen. Earth is a foundational aspect of the body. Earth wants to be known as Earth. Earth, Rupa, Earth form. I'd like to invite us to listen to Joy Harjo, the wonderful poet, uh, understand earth. So this is a from um, one of her poems. This poem is called for calling the spirit back from wandering the earth in its human feet. And this isn't the whole poem that's part of it. Put down that bag of potato chips, that white bread, that bottle pop. Turn off that cell phone, computer, and remote control. Open the door, then close it behind you. Take a breath offered by friendly winds. They travel the earth gathering essence of plants to clean. Give it back with gratitude. If you sing, it will give your spirit lift to fly to the star's ears and back. Acknowledge this earth who has cared for you since you were a dream, planting itself precisely within your parents' desire. Let your moccasin feet take you to the encampment of the guardians who have known you before time, who will be there after time. They sit before the fire that has been there without time. Let the earth stabilize your post-colonial insecure jitters. The poem goes on. So I want to ask myself every day, where will the mountains and waters be known? From where and how will they be expressed? From the earth. What earth? Where? Here. And here. All of the facets. Right here. Shohaku Okamura Sama tells us that Mahayana, Mahayana Buddhists believe they could see the Buddha, they could hear the voice of the Buddha in a different way that didn't rely on written records and records of what the Buddha taught in his lifetime. You know, you know the story of, um, there's a couple of different stories, but some old woman comes and throws all the monks books on the ground or sets them alight or pours tea all over him. That's the same. 
That's the same story. Um, uh, Shohaku says, try to see the colors of the mountains yourself. Try to hear the actual sounds of the valley streams yourself as your own experience and try to share that experience when other, with others. In other words, directly knowing that the mountains are walking, that the mountains are flowing. So one time uh, I went to a session on Whidbey Island uh, with one drop Zendo. Um, we, we had the session in somebody's ho house, like kind of a big house. Um, and it was uh, Rosh Hashanah at that time. And so one day uh, I kind of skipped out with my friend from work period, who was a Catholic worker person. And um, we ran away to a lake because I wanted to read the service for Rosh Hashanah. Uh, I told the Eno that my ancestors would haunt me if I didn't. So in the middle of the session, we went to this lake and um, I was reading the service uh, out loud, some of it. And uh, what happened was I, I realized that the Hebrew words were not descriptors of something. They were the something. There's there's a lot of paintings where the Hebrew letters are like dancing, and I, I didn't understand that when I was a kid. I thought that was really boring. Um, but at that time, I realized, oh, I mean, I don't know what to say exactly. Like, oh, the mountains are walking. Um, and then at lunch, we would, we would chant the Heart Sutra at lunch and the trees, I realized the trees were chanting the Heart Sutra during that session. So I would say Zazen is a training in just this and Zazen is a non-training in just this also. So you guys know that I trained to be a chaplain and I was a chaplain at the University Hospital in Hennepin County. And that training was a continuation of the mountains flowing. It offered a, a session like structure in which to practice awareness while listening and talking and walking and writing and typing. It was concentrated, you know, like concentrated orange juice, like a session. And it was relational in a completely uncontrolled way, different to a session. And sometimes embodiment showed itself without me involved at all. So I'll tell you a story or two. Um, one time I was at Hennepin County Medical Center and I worked from 3.30 to 11 usually. And I was just in the elevator going up probably to the third floor from the emergency room. And somebody, another staff person, got on the elevator with me. And I probably just said hi. And then I was just standing there and the person grabbed my name tag thing, you know, my badge and said, what do you do here? And grabbed my badge and the badge said, chaplain. And I said, he said that he said, oh, you're a chaplain. Um, can I have some of that? I didn't, you know, I was like, what are you talking about? I said, you can have all of it. It's not mine. I don't know what you mean. But there was an embodiment. There was something that I don't know what it was, but it was palpable. It was palpable. The mountains were flowing. And another way that embodiment showed up was unexpectedly in the emergency room, it's called the stabilization room. It's just like on TV. All these people 
are coming in and out, policemen, the emergency people, the wheeled stretchers, the nurses, the doctors, layers of nurses and doctors, just coming in, coming in, going, coming, lots of commotion. And I learned how to cruise around the stretchers and cruise in to ask the patient if there was someone we could call and cruise out again, you know, when the doctor came in. So there was this flowing thing happening in the middle of this huge drama all the time. So what still interests me and what has always interested me was how does this practice and even to say practice is uh i need to go back to t.s Eliot. even to say practice is not right like it's too uh limited it's too concretized but i don't know what other word to say so how does this practice unfold itself in the moment in relationship to you know fill in the blank that's what interests me how is wisdom and compassion acted out in the body, from the body, in the moment, anywhere in the world? How does timeless time show up anywhere, anytime? How It's an art form. How does it play itself out? And there's not an answer, you know, <laughs> like that would destroy the question. <laughs> so wisdom and compassion acted out by and in the body movement and stillness are not separate so back to t.s Eliot. at the still point of the turning world neither flesh nor fleshless neither from nor towards at the still point there the dance is but neither arrest nor movement and do not call it fixity where past and future are gathered neither movement from nor towards neither ascent nor decline except for the point the still point there would be no dance and there is only the dance when i was in my 20s you know i went to a lectures by katagiri roshi every uh, sunday morning and wednesday night and so one wednesday night he was talking about the tree of faith, the tree of faith. And I, I didn't grow up hearing about faith. I mean, I grew up in a tradition, but we didn't talk about faith exactly like that. And so with great trepidation, I raised my hand at the question time. And I really wanted to know this faith thing. So I, I said, um, well, Hojo-san, how do we grasp the tree of faith? You know, like, how? And there I was, you know, Ugh. and he just looked at me and he said, you just do it, of course. <laughs> but I wanted to know, how? <laughs> how do we just do it? <laughs> I agree that basically you just do it. We just do it. But how can one nudge oneself along by practicing sensing the body and how the sensations are constantly changing? We can stay gently with the changes just as we stay with the breath. We can come to realize the earth of the body by experiencing it repeatedly. It's music. It's art. It's an instrument that we were given without an instruction booklet, right? Where is that instruction book? I used to say that to myself when I was working at Hennepin County. Where is the instruction booklet for what just happened or what is about to happen? There was no instruction booklet. So one of the ingredients required for our investigation is heartfulness and returning, heartfulness and returning. In the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, there's a prayer called the Vaha'avta. And Vaha'avta means, and you shall love. 
it's really famous. And I'm going to say it in English. You shall love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Take to heart these instructions which I charge you this day. Impress them upon your children. Recite them when you stay at home and when you walk along the way, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them serve as a symbol on your forehead. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So when I started studying mindfulness, I kind of remembered this prayer because it's practice all the time, return all the time. That's how we just do it, just do it. We turn on the awareness switch of presence. These are the instructions in all the religious traditions that I know something about. It's the same instruction. And we have the chance all the time to return. And there are some terrific times when everything is set up for us so that we can do this without so much obstruction and distraction, like for instance, Sishin practice, and also practicing in your backyard, you know, all of it. But, you know, some, I always say, well, Horowitz didn't practice the piano in the middle of Fifth Avenue. You know, he had a quieter place to practice where he could uh, concentrate. And if we don't just do it, Joy Harjo uh, tells us what might happen. This is uh, a poem of hers called Invisible Fish. Invisible fish swim this ghost ocean now described by waves of sand, by water-worn rock. Soon the fish will learn to walk. Then humans will come ashore and paint dreams on the dying stone. Then later, much later, the ocean floor will be punctuated by Chevy trucks carrying the dreamers descendants who are going to the store. Uh, the earth comprised our bodies so we can turn towards this aggregated composition called body and its art of knowing will reveal its wisdom to us. The earth of our earth can relearn how to rest on the earth. All the molecules are dancing all the time. The vast space of possibility floats open all the time. All we have to do is turn and return forever. And I'm going to end with part of Shitu's poem. Turn around the light to shine within, then just return. The vast, inconceivable source can't be faced or turned away from. Meet the ancestral teachers, be familiar with their instruction. Bind grasses to build a hut and don't give up. Let go of hundreds of years and relax completely. Open your hands and walk innocent. Thousands of words, myriad interpretations are only to free you from obstructions. If you want to know the undying person in the hut, don't separate from this skin bag here and now. That's all I have to say this morning. If you want to say anything, I guess this is when that happens. Yeah.
Doka-san. Hello. Good morning. Um, good morning. Uh, um, well, you struck a chord for me when you started talking about T.S. Eliot. Uh -oh. um, he was one of my favorite uh, poets when I was studying uh, English literature in, in uh, college, but I never knew why, but some of those lines you just said, which I don't remember, probably were the reason, but I do remember um, a, uh, the, the love song of J. Alfred Proof rock oh, and I oh, said, right. Yeah. I said, what a title, the love song of J. Alfred Proof Rock. But, I know, right? but anyway, I, I signed off for like 30 seconds and went and got my poetry book. And I looked it up. And what I remember are these lines. Uh, I don't know if I can find it right now. Oh, oh there we go. I found it. I got it in parentheses in my book. <laughs> See it. This yeah. was from like 50 years ago. <laughs> and uh, one of the lines he said was, I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. <laughs> does, does, do anyone, does anyone remember that line from there? No. <laughs> it just it struck me, wow. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. <laughs> it's like... When I read that line when I was like 18, I thought, wow, that hits the mark. That hits the mark for me. So anyway, I I hadn't thought of that for 30 years, I don't think. <laughs> until this so, it was one of my favorite lines when I was 18 or 19 years old in poetry. Um, not that I believe that now, but anyway, he, he really stuck a note for me when I was uh, in in my 20s and uh, you've stimulated me to think uh, maybe I need to go back and read a little bit more of T.S. Eliot than, <laughs> than uh, what, I, what I did in the past. So thanks a lot for your talk, appreciated it very much. Okay, that's uh, all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe san you know, it strikes me that that line you remembered sounds a little bit like the Joy Harjo, the fish thing that I read, the invisible fish. Soon the fish will learn to walk, right? Invisible sw fish swim this ghost ocean, now described by waves of sand by water-worn rock. Soon the fish will learn to walk. That's kind of reminds me of that. Yeah, I, um, I I liked the lines. I, I I don't know what poem was from, but you you would say don't. I mean, the last line was don't call it fixity. Oh uh, yeah, that's from the. It's not. It's not that. Yeah, that's the, from the four. You know what poem that's from? The four quartets. Oh, four quartets. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I remember that one too. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Mary. Hi, Mary. Hi. Um, I just want to thank you. Um, you know, all I um, have, have listened to you uh, whenever I am able. And what I really appreciate about your Dharma talks um, is that you weave your uh, your occupation as a chaplain. I always really appreciate those stories. And you also weave your uh, religious tradition, your, the Judaism that you knew um, as a young person. And you weave that so beautifully into uh, Buddhism. And that very much strikes a chord with me because um, I grew up with uh, Christianity as my religious tradition. And I'm constantly <laughs> um, looking for ways that that 
um, weaves uh, with Buddhism, which I now practice. And so I, I really, I just, I want to thank you so much for that. That's, um, that's really, really important to me. And I, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm glad we can appreciate that together. Yeah. Mary, are you going to say something? You became unmuted. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Mary yeah. Oh, sorry, I wasn't sure what I was doing there. I'm on my phone, which is harder to, oh. to read. Um, well, I, I guess I just wanted to say thank you, particularly for um, articulating that whole concept of body versus no body. I mean, I think it's a complicated process, and I think there's always a tendency for students of of Buddhism to think it has something to do with denial. And I think that the more that is illustrated that it does not have anything to do with denial of, of the senses is helpful. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I, cause I always get stuck on that, but I appreciate what you said. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Jan, son. Um, last weekend, I did a workshop with Upaya on uh, being with dying. And I hate to bring up morbid topics again, but the whole, and um, Roshi Joan Halifax has been working with the dying for um, 50 years. Mm -hmm. This is one of the first things that she worked with. And she has some very good friends who've been helping her with this. And so she had, um, as other speakers, a nurse eth 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 uh -huh. eth ethical person yeah. and, a and a palliative care doctor. Yeah. And the basic thing was, you know, everybody who was signed up, there were 300 people signed up and everybody had their stories about death. Yeah. And all the all the stories are very touching, and we didn't have time for all three hundred stories about death. But the whole point was, there's no there's no fixity. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a it's just a real a real thing that happens, mm -hmm. a very very real thing, and it affects people deeply because it is such a real thing. But there's no. I think people were looking for some kind of hopefully finding a formula to deal with it, and there's no formula. So that's 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 what I related to your talk. And she also, um, I don't know, nurses are quitting in uh, record numbers because they weren't trained to deal with the mass death that they've had to deal with, and it's like she's she was recommending chaplaincy training for everyone who's a clinician in the medical area. Wow. So, wow. Because, because there's no fixity, there's no formula. So um, yeah. I guess without getting into the rest of it, that's, that's what I wanted to add. And thank you for reminding me of no fixity. Thank you, Jen. It's yours. What you talked about is reminding me last night I was at a little birthday party that Edo was at and Shokin was there and he talked about his cat. His cat's name was Woof, Woofer. Woofy, Woofy, Ado knows, Woofy. And um, we all wanted to hear exactly what happened about that cat dying. You know, 
he was like, well, the cat died. And we were like, yeah, but what do you mean? <laughs> but, you know, what exactly happened? It's, you know, and he talked about um, exactly what happened. And then he, he told a story about, okay, I might not get this right. Maybe Ada will remember. The cows, some, somebody watching the cows die in India, this cow was dying. And these people were just watching the cow die. And do you remember this, Ado? And um, oh, <laughs> and um, and then someone said, "Why are you watching the cow die?" You know, to these people, and they said, "Because that's us." You know, that's the we're that's us di dying. We we need to know what that is. So I that just came up, Jan, from your bringing that up. Yeah. Well, we did, <laughs> we basically did um, guided meditation on the nine contemplations, which is basically, oh yeah, it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. And there's no, there's no, there's no telling. And then, uh, I don't know, the, the, the crowd, even 300 people, the crowd, basically like most crowds so zen people it's an older crowd and the mortality is uh beginning to impinge so mm -hmm. yeah so that was pretty powerful yeah thank you i i always i make this joke like why zen isn't more popular what kind of religion would you want to go visit that sells Sickness, old age, and death. Nobody wants to go study that. <laughs> anyway, all right, enough. Yes, Henry. Hi, Henry. Don't forget to unmute yourself, darling. You're muted, Henry. Henry. Henry, Henry, you have to click the thing so we can hear you talk. We all want to hear what you have to say. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, can you do it? You can. Yeah. Okay. Unmute him. Just a second, Henry. We're going to try to help you. Just click that. <laughs> Can you just unmute everybody or something? No. Henry, do you know how to unmute yourself? <laughs> We're missing all these pearls that are coming out of your mouth. <laughs> I don't know how to un unmute Henry. It's not, it's not letting you. It's, it's not letting me do it. So. Okay. Um, Henry, can you ask? Can, is your wife there? Can she come and unmute you? Okay. He's gonna go get her. <laughs> We go. Thank you. Help has arrived. Help has arrived. Help has arrived. Henry, speak. Okay. Am I? Okay. Fine. Thank you. Well, this was an example of a little death. <laughs> Unmuting experience. 
you know, one thing that I find satisfaction in is you can't get it wrong the way you die. There is no way to die. And to me, that's a great, any way it's going to be, it's all right. I can't screw it up. That's the final big perfection. You can't screw it up. And, you know, we're always very concerned about screwing up, making a mistake. So I find that very reassuring. It's just like walking. You can screw up walking. And if you fall, that's part of the perfection of walking. And if you scream while you're dying, that's part of the perfection of dying. So, you know, the door is so wide open. So dying, you know, obviously I will never know how it will be, but this is my 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 preconception and i hope i don't have it while i'm doing it (laughs) because any preconception is is a burden it's just like when you you know when you have when you're looking on the map for minnesota the map can interfere with your finding it actually so good, Henry. Oh my gosh. You know, oh my it's, gosh. It's, so that's, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I. Henry. What? Did somebody ask, say something? Henry, uh, I have a question for you. I have a question for you. It's your preconcept, preconception you can't screw it up. It might be mine that you can. So, so well, that's what do you fine think too. about that. How I could I could screw up dying. Well, that, that don't okay. buy it. that's your unique okay, as problem. long as that's on the table too. <laughs> that's your unique problem. Okay, you can screw it up or you can't screw it up. <laughs> Whatever it is. Okay. Well, Doka, you know, some people make things harder than for themselves and others. Uh, you know, I look at perfection the way things are and the way they're not. Now tell me, how do you escape that? You know, perfection is the way things are and the way they're not. So the, and death is the same way. It is the way it is and the way it is not. So, you know, all it is. Yeah, well, I'm also thinking, however death is, is the way life is, so. (laughs) Say that again. He said, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking, however, the way death is, yeah. is exactly the way life is. Right. So, and it's, you know what, it's it, my sense, it's not very special. You know, at one time I thought when I die, you know, there would be music playing and there would be the right people there. You know, it might happen while I'm sitting on the toilet. <laughs> and that's, that's toilet dying. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> if I have a preconception, nobody's gonna be there. Nobody's gonna be there. So it's like Well, it, it you know what? See, that's another thing. Anyway. It's gonna be the way it is. And I don't have to you yeah. know, I just have to be present to it. And if I'm not present, then I'm not even present to it. And that's okay too. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, it's, it's, I, I like to think sometimes death is like drinking water. Don't make it hard. Uh, you know? <laughs> Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Is there anybody else? Feel moved to Edo-san. Well, I was just going to respond to Henry with something um, Sawaki Roshi said, I think. He said, oh, don't worry about death. It's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you know, it's, it's, you can say that's maybe the final toilet act is dying. <laughs> 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to say yes, Mary, please. I just can't help myself here. Um, I, if you have the opportunity in any way, volunteering, or if you are invited into an inner circle, or if you can have this experience, I would highly recommend being with a dying person as they die. I've had that privilege a number of times in my own personal life and as a, a, a nurse. And it changes you. Um, in powerful ways. So I just want to say that. <clears throat> um, I mean, you can do it with an, a four legged, a dog, a cat, anything. Just be there, be there with a dying being. Um, it's, I'm going to say, it's, it's like the best. I, I'm not kidding. It's the best. <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had to disagree with that. <laughs> no, I had yeah. an experience with a horse. The horse was very old and it needed to die. So, you know, with a horse, you dig a pit with a ramp and then you walk the horse into the ramp. And then, you know, and the vet, he said, you know, it's such an old animal, I have to give two different medications because the system doesn't work that well, even to take up the medication that will kill. And, you know, so the horse was in the pit and I was there and it was dying, you guys. There's such a relief coming from that animal. Mm -hmm. I can still taste it now. Mm -hmm. There was such peace coming from from that horse that was, you know, dying in the pit. And um, there was no great sounds, but just just this, like a gas, or what you know. Even putting words on it, you have to put something on it, and they're all lies. But you know, and. It was uh, maybe the sweetest perfume I ever inhaled. To see the horse die. It even touches me now mm -hmm. very deeply. Thank you, Henry. Uh, okay, how are we doing? It does anyone else want to say something about Earth? <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you very much, Miao O. Oh, that was a wonderful talk and a great discussion this morning. And so now I just have a couple announcements, um, upcoming events at um, Clouds and at uh, Hokyoji, the Clouds and Water Zen Center comes July 11th. Um, one has to um, sign up for that with the Clouds website. Um, there's a family community weekend, August 5th through 7th. I think we might have some music at that some people playing music, and we have a wonderful young family who's organizing the event. There are other events on the calendar that are with other groups that are now closed. Um, you can always come and do a personal retreat at Hokyoji when we're not having an event. Please consider us for that. Um, the speaker next week is Akio Susan Nelson. 
Who's that? I don't know, but she's going to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd like it if you would spread the word about our Sunday talks. You can like us on Facebook or on your Instagram pages. Um, your donations are always appreciated. I didn't put the link in the chat this morning, but you can easily find that on our website. And to close, let's chant, let's do the four vows. They're in your chat. Beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to realize it. Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful Bye. day. Okay. <laughs> Thank Bye. You. Have a Thank good day, you. everybody. Bye. <laughs>